Hunters, before getting into this next episode, we want to thank you and our sponsors for supporting the Flushing and Dustin podcast. Keeping our dogs safe while hunting, training, or traveling from one location to another and helping them perform to the best of their ability is important to us. We keep a first aid kit from Gundog Outdoors in our trucks and carry one of on our hunt ready vests in the event our dogs obtain an injury while hunting. We also carry their water bottle to keep our dogs hydrated while in the field. To check out these products and other safety gear, head over to Gundog Outdoors at gundogoutdoors.com and use code RINGNEX to save 10%. We transport our dogs to the hunting and training fields in our G3 Dakota 283 kennels. These kennels are one solid piece of military grade material and now have the option to add a feature called Dakota Guard. This adds an antimicrobial protection to the kennels that is FDA and EPA approved and is proven highly effective against Salmonella, E. coli, and much more. Not only do they care about the safety of your dog, they also care about your dog's health. Dakota 283 also provides other specialized gear to ensure our dogs have enough water and food for a full day's hunt and to safely store and secure our gear in our vehicles. Check out Dakota 283 at dakota283.com and use code RNR10 at checkout to save 10%. To ensure our dogs are primed for the field and receiving the nutrition they need to work harder and to help maintain their joints, we feed you new dog food. We feel you can do the dog food provides our dogs year after year with the strength and endurance to perform at the best of their ability. Lastly, become a patron at patreon.com for exclusive giveaways and discounts. Again, thank you to everyone for helping us continue to bring you Flushman and Dustin episodes. Hi hunters, thank you for tuning into the Flushman and Dustin podcast brought to you by Nick and Tyler. The boys from Ringnecks and Retrievers. In this podcast, we will talk about guns, dogs, gear, and our successes and failures in the field through our combined 40 years of experience. We speak with hunters just like you from across the nation about their days in the field and the many memories they built with their friends and family. We are excited to have you listen. Now let's get to Flushing and Dustin. Hunters, welcome back to the Flushing and Dustin podcast. Uh, we are excited to have you back on. Tonight we have a special guest. He is known as the Quail Hawk on Instagram. Uh, his first name is actually Tyler, just like mine. So that's pretty cool. Um, you can find him on Instagram at Quail underscore Hawk. So Tyler, could you introduce yourself and give us a rundown of what you do and how you hunt? Right on. Uh, my name is Tyler Slayton. I, I live in central New Mexico. I, uh, I hunt with shotgun a good bit, but I mostly hunt with uh, a male goshawk named Hash Brown. Um, I've got a string of uh, English setters. I've got a cocker spaniel, and then I've got a little yag terrier. Um, nice. And then I've got some beastlers as well. So does um, so I got a little bit of everything. How um, does mostly? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we mostly hunt scaled quail, uh, gambles quail, and a little bit of Mern's quail where I'm live. Um, if we travel, we'll hunt anything else, but that's the three that I have around the house. Nice. So what got you into, what's it like not having to have the, ex... go ahead, Tyler. Oh, what did you, you say? What got you into hawking or hunting with a hawk? Uh, I was in the army at the time. Um, this was almost 10 years ago. Um, I had seen, um, a group of falconers they were out hunting with some terriers and some harris hawks and they were hunting squirrels and um at one point the humans almost became irrelevant in the equation and it was just hawks hunting with dogs chasing squirrels and i was like this this is so cool um i had no idea like what else could be done at the time and then over the years i've seen so many different types of falconry and that's that's probably the biggest uh, draw to falconry for me, at least, is that uh, there's just no matter where you live, there's so many different combos and ways you can do it. Whereas gun hunting, you're pretty limited on uh, flushing dogs, pointing dogs. Every now and then you'll have someone hunting over something weird, like a border collie or something, but it's pretty routine with how everybody does it. But falconry, I mean, if you're hunting quail, you can hunt quail with a hare hawk over pointing dogs. You can hunt them with a merlin falcon over flushing dogs you can hunt them with a goshawk over pointing dogs and um there's just so many different ways or you can go hunt rabbits with all those same birds too and it just depends on what you want to do and what you got so how do the hawks differ so you say do you have a goshawk 
Yeah, so I have a North American goshawk. So um, birds of prey are separated by wing shape, typically. Um, so you've got long wings, broad wings, and then eagles. So, And then you've got short wings as well. So a goshawk would be what we would call a short wing. Um, so a way a short wing works is their rapid acceleration, typically off the fist. So um, you flush quail and they chase quail off the fist, whereas like a falcon – they would go up really, really high and then you would flush ducks underneath them and they would come down at like 150 to 200 miles an hour and then hit the duck or hit the grouse or whatever they flushed for it. And that's, that's how those work. So those are the, the big differences. And then there's broad wings, which would be like your Harris hawks, your red, your red tails. They can hunt anything from squirrels in trees to rabbits off the fist to, um, jackrabbits off the fist whatever you want and then sometimes some people take red tails and they'll they'll hunt from a source similar to a falcon um but their their birds are up there for much longer than what a falcon would be on a on a duck flight <laughs> it becomes That's information crazy. overload like really fast Dude, yeah, like, there's, there's so much to it i didn't realize that people hunted squirrels and rabbits and ducks like you know oh, I yeah, figured, they, like that's insane they hunt everything man there's there's groups of falconers that only hunt starlings and sparrows uh, <laughs> and they'll do it in a home depot parking lot that's it's just that's what's cool about falconry it, it it changes so much based on where you live and who's doing it like when i lived in st louis i only hunted i hunted primarily starlings with a kestrel um like a little kestrel falcon i mean they're they're about the size of a can of Coke. They're, they're tiny. Um, oh, man. And, and he huh. stacked them. He caught so many starlings. That's crazy. So how do you go about training a hawk to know what to do when a bird, like let's say for your quail, what to do when one flushes and then kind of bring in, how do you train your dogs to also be cool with a hawk? With that, there's, I mean, this you're, you're, we're talking about one of the oldest ways of hunting in existence. So there's so many ways to do it. Um, so, I mean, I'll just talk about what I do. So for a goshawk and quail, the main thing is keeping them confident on quail. They naturally want to chase quail because goshawks are very reactive in nature. They see something moving fast and they want to move fast too and catch it. That's just how they're wired. Um, hmm. So in the beginning, it, it's a matter of keeping him in shape, but also keeping him confident because, um, when I was raising him, um, he didn't know how to catch quail and he didn't know if he would chase quail the full way that if he got a second chance at that same quail, um, he had the better chance because a hawk's got more stamina than a quail does. It's they're, they're a light meat bird. So typically when you look at a bird's meat, um, when, when they're, when they're light meat, they, they're not made to fly long distances. So quail and pheasant i mean they'll fly a good ways but compared to like a sharp tail or a sage grouse it's it's nothing they they don't fly that far at all so for a hawk to fly down a pheasant or a quail is much shorter of an order than it would be to ask them to fly down a sage grouse um and that's why you would hunt sage grouse entirely different than how you'd hunt quail so in the beginning um it was a matter when he was young quail were young too and then our falconry seasons are different for that reason so we would um we were catching three quarter grown quail at the time, but he was three quarter grown. So it was a three quarter grown hawk catching three quarter grown quail. And then over time he became more confident in in his abilities and his fitness also improved. So uh, eventually he was catching adult quail and, and then his second season, he didn't need that early start. He didn't, I didn't even pull him out of his chamber till mid October. So by then quail are fully grown and he was just catching adults or full size um <laughs> so crazy yeah as far as introducing the dogs i don't like to i used to think you had to introduce puppies and that was just i just didn't know any better and i didn't have the well to draw from to say no you don't need to now i wait till a dog's at least a year old has a pair of brakes installed and then i'll then i'll introduce them um and at that point the hawk already knows trained dogs so the hawk will help help you train that dog too because the hawk has a personal space um, bubble and they don't want dogs inside that bubble for the most part, or at least mine doesn't. He, uh, 
he'll give a dog an education really quick if a dog enters his bubble and they figure that out it's a they've got they've got talons and they're pretty fast and just their body posture alone usually by them flaring their wings at a dog most dogs with a brain are like i don't want any of that um i'll wait you'll see in a lot of my photos like dogs they'll hide behind me or they'll go lay off to the side they just they know they they know to give him his space and uh some dogs learn faster than others which is pretty much all i can say on that um i still i have a five-year-old dog who still kind of forgets those boundaries every now and then but he gets a reminder all the time and it's not for me it's from the bird and that's fine because my bird's trained but if my bird was early in development i'd be a little bit harder on the dog just because i don't want him to interfere with what we're trying to achieve that's crazy so how long will hash brown be able to do this for i don't even know like like you know dogs you're saying oh if they can hunt 10 12 years it's pretty good hunting life how long can a hawk go for um there's guys out there still hunting goshawks after 20 years um that is an insane anomaly like that is so not normal um i mean ideally in a perfect world if they were in a chamber they would live that long no matter what but um when you're hunting them there's so much that can go wrong with a bird um i i know of three goshawks from other falconers this year that all died hitting fences you got to think they're chasing quail at 55 to 65 miles an hour when they fly through a barbed wire fence. That's a dicey situation. So um, that's just one thing. I mean, there's electrocutions, there's stray dogs, there's coyotes, eagles. There's a lot of things. They got to run the gauntlet every day. So um, I'd say the average goshawk that makes it through its first year in falconry, probably five, six years is a good run before something crazy happens. But it just, there's, I mean, my season, our season for falconry is 180 days, and um, on average, I get out there at least 150. So that's a lot of room for things to go wrong with a bird. Um, I'm pretty good at mitigating those risks, um, keeping them away from electricity, keeping them away from stray dogs and people on dirt bikes and stuff like that. But things like fences and red tails and eagles that want to eat him and um coyotes coming in on him on rabbits uh, you can only do so much to mitigate those risks those that's just part of it so what you just walk you just walk out in the field with him on your arm yep like um i call her up the dogs i let the dogs go let them get a little bit of distance i pull him out of his box i put a transmitter on i check to make sure the transmitter is working and then uh he rides my glove until we flush quail how much does he weigh you he just Sorry, you both ask the question at the same time. How much does he weigh, like carrying him on your arm all day? So he's about 660 grams, so he's about a pound and a half. He doesn't weigh that much. (laughs) But, I I mean, keeping your arm up and balanced and stable for three hours at a time, I mean, you get used to it, Um, but he doesn't. So when a a quail flushes – then hash brown will just take off or do you got like a little string on him or like he's free to do whatever he wants i I, the only time you'll ever see me hold him back is if like someone's on a dirt bike's coming up or a truck's driving by or something sketchy but usually i'm stopping the dogs at that point too um it's just where i'm at in the desert you, you can't go anywhere and not run into people i mean i've been 20 miles away from town and in the middle of the desert and here comes karen and two huskies on a leash and just you never know (laughs) i I, we have a running joke it's the desert makes people materialize and it never fails like my wife was out hunting her first bird one time and we were in the middle of nowhere we hadn't seen anyone in two hours and right as her bird caught a rabbit here comes like six kids on dirt bikes i'm like i i I don't know my wife wasn't used to it at the time but i i told her i was like there's it just happens you got to share the space so that's part of it. So when obviously you give a re- release or you release um, hash brown and when he catches the quail, what's your, what's your next step after that? Or if he doesn't um, catch the quail, how do you get him to come back? I mean, do you quail ever get away? Oh, they get away all the time. Um, so a lot of times um, the average 
chase would be about 300 yards, 300 to 400 yards. Um, that's how far they'll fly with a goshawk Holy behind shit. them. Yeah. So a lot of times if I don't get there fast, he'll be on one side of the bush and the quail is in the bush and my bird is so excited. He's like running circles around the bush. Well, the quail will squirt out the other side and I might not see it and he might not see it. So that's a good instance where they get away. And then there's a lot of times where they just go down badger holes and stuff like that. And it just, you're not getting them out. So, um, that happens a lot. Um, at that point, I, I don't know if he has it or not until I get there. So either way, I'm, I just go pick them up. Um, a lot of times I can tell. And then him and my male Vizsla, my oldest Vizsla, they, they've got like this um, little anarchy thing going on where they'll see me coming and most of the time uh, he'll hold it, but sometimes the dog gets excited and will reflush it again. And then like I had just ran 300 yards, well, it just goes another 300 yards and they're off to the races again, like right as I get there. And it's like, damn, um, I enjoy it. Um, I, I'm, it's cool that they have that relationship, but sometimes like I want to get there, catch my breath. I'm like, all right, give me a second before we start this again. But they, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's really hard to explain, but I try to take everyone out. Well, that, that, can. that, that makes sense. Like if they're getting quail to fly that far, I see why if you're, if you're, if hash browns, you know, on the ground and coyotes are around or something, hundred percent see, how he could be taken out because he's so far away from you. Yeah. And it's, it's not so much on the quail that he, that he gets taken out. Like he's had like five or six rabbits over the years stolen from him by coyotes. Um, so he catches a rabbit 200 yards away and a rabbit. I mean, I mean, what does a predator call when you're calling predators? It's a, it's a rabbit scream. So when he catches a rabbit, every coyote in the area comes in and um, I've had a few tangles where the coyotes running away with the rabbit and, and the bird's hanging off the side of it. And uh, that's terrifying, man. It's it's just such a scary situation. Um, there's not much you can do. You can't, if the bird's hanging off a, a rabbit in a coyote's mouth, you can't, you can't shoot at them. It's not going to do anything. So all you can do is yell and hope the dogs catch up fast. But like, my setters aren't going to do anything. Like they're not going to throw down with a coyote. So, man, that is crazy. <laughs> I, th- I thought the bird was uh, like, I thought he was bigger than just a pound and a half, you know, like from the, the pictures that I've seen you post on Instagram, I was thinking he was more like five or six pounds, you know, would be able to no. tangle yeah, with a, a, like a rooster size, you know, like bi- a little bit bigger than a ringneck pheasant rooster, but yeah. Pheasant weigh about twice what he does. Usually they're pretty big. Man, that is crazy. Jeez. Um, I, <laughs> I, it hasn't happened to me, but I know people that have had rooster pheasant kill their hawks over the years. They, there's a reason roosters are so bold and you see them walking out in stubble. Like they're not afraid of much, you know, they, they have those spurs for a reason and they do kill hawks with them. And that's insane. Huh. So when you're storing or not storing, you, you, you have hash brown in his, his pen, his flight pen. Is that what he's in or what? like what's he's got a cage? he's got a chamber in my backyard and the only it, it's essentially a shed with windows but the windows are um, conduit bars that are all vertically s- slatted so that if he grabs against it and puts his feathers through it it's not going to fray and mess up his feathers like a like chicken wire or something would so it's just it's just a fancy chicken coop we would call it a muse and falconry um and then everything is backwards so all the studs and framework is on the outside so that it's completely smooth on the inside so Uh that he doesn't hurt himself but he doesn't really count how big is that uh, shit it's the one he's in is eight by 12 by 12 so it's uh oh 12 feet wide eight feet uh eight feet deep and then 12 feet tall he's it's pretty it's pretty decent size he doesn't really do much in there he he sits in the window and he, um, my dog runs are all around his chamber. So he sits in the window and watches the dogs all day and judges them for being dumb dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially they're all his peasants. So <laughs> yeah, shit, they don't want to mess with them. <laughs> yeah. They know, they know better. So do you get him out? Like, do you get him out and like, how do you keep him fresh? you know, in the off season or like when you, 
first there's get nothing. It. I mean, from from about now till September, he'll be in there, and I bring him food daily and fresh water daily, and that's goshawks by nature are very solitary, so um, he he doesn't really want to be bothered when. So when he's when he's hunting, he's at what we would call a hunting weight, which is about 650, 660. And then when it gets colder, it starts to creep up a little, almost about right around 700 grams. But when he's molting and he's growing new feathers in the off season, he's up around like 850, almost 900. Um, so when he's at weights like that, he really doesn't want much to do with me. Um, he just he's cool with being 15 feet away and looking down at me from a perch, but that's about it he doesn't really want to be bothered so he's so he's pretty sedentary in the off season yeah he's got i mean food comes through a chute every morning and he's got fresh water so he his needs are all met so they're pretty they're pretty cool with just doing doing their thing in there um but then come like mid-september i'll pull him back out and he'll be in the living room for about a month (laughs) while i cut his weight um, he's got a perch and a big, I bring a big horse stall mat. My living room's pretty big. So I bring a horse stall mat in, put some moving blankets down. And then I, then he does like, um, s- uh, small exercises to earn food each day and he's got to go back to work. And what that's doing is it's, it's putting his fitness back in check before we start showing him quail. Cause if they're not fit and you start showing them things they normally catch, um, you'll burn their confidence and then they just won't chase him anymore. Um, if they don't have the, the fitness to do it. Jeez, that's crazy. That's... So where do you, <laughs> like, let's say I wanted to get into falconry or chasing quail with a goshawk. Where do you go to one to find someone that breeds these? Uh, and then like, what's a resource for learning how to, to train one? So, uh, so the falconry is legal in 49 states of the 50. Hawaii is the only one that's not legal in. So you'd start out by going through your state club. Every state has a club. So what state are you in? We're in Iowa. Iowa. So there's, there's actually quite a few falconers up in Iowa. Um, you would just reach out to a, your state club and they'd put you in touch with someone who had time to help you. And, um, you would take a test through your state, um, it's it's a usually about a hundred question test and then uh you would build that chamber that that hash brown has and then the game warden would come and inspect it and then your sponsor the person that agreed to help you learn he would take you to trap your first red tail and then you'd go get a red tail and you would train and hunt that for two years under his supervision and then at the end of your two years if you did good he signs off and then you get your general status so All in all, I mean, once you find your sponsor and you get your chamber built, I mean, you're just really waiting until the beginning of hunting season and you'd go trap your bird with your sponsor. So it doesn't take that long to get into. It's once you're started, you'll, you'll realize the more you learn, the less, you know, it's just one of those things. Um, Cause I mean, you could fly a red tail on squirrels for your whole life, but there's people that take red tails to the next level and they catch pheasants with them. Um, they would they'll put their red tail up on like a telephone pole over a ditch and go flush pheasants out of the ditch and their red tail will catch them on the rise um and that's what some people do so you could be doing that in a couple months from now if you if you chose um oh that's cr- crazy i'm like uh, speechless they, i don't even know what, i don't even know what to say about that <laughs> yeah one of the biggest golf awesome. breeders in the country is up in iowa his name's lance christensen he's up in uh northwestern iowa and he hunts pheasant and uh, stuff with his goshawks up there. Is this guy on Instagram? No, Lance is not really a social media type, but I could give you his contact info. Man, most falconers, just... m- most of the older falconers are very not like the social media type, and it's understandable. So Yeah. I think can you have just... more than one hawk at a time, or can you only have the one? In your apprentice years, you can only have one. So for your first two years, you can only have one. And then every state's different when you reach your general status. And then um, after five years, you would bump up to what they would call master status. And then at that point, you can have as many 
captive red birds as you want, but you're still limited to three wild birds. Um, but that's that's <laughs> it's just insane to me. This is crazy. So you literally, so hash brown it was. Is he your first bird? No, he's not, not even close. He's uh, okay. yeah, I've had quite a few birds. So uh, so literally, these birds are they're not like a dog breeder, you know, where they're they breed the dogs, they sell them. You know, you literally go out and trap all these birds and then train them. Well, you would, yeah, you'd trap one and train it, but. Yeah, you, you would drive down the road once traffic. So every state's different. So I don't really know Iowa's laws, but I'd assume sometime mid-August, early September, you'd, you'd be allowed to go trap red tails. And what you're looking for is you're looking for a juvenile red tail. You can't just trap any red tail. You would need a, a first-year bird. And they look very different. So it's very easy to tell with them in hand. And uh, you'd find them on a telephone pole and you'd, you'd set a trap under that telephone pole with like a gerbil in it you'd drive away and you'd watch with binoculars and the red tail would come down off the pole and get caught on your trap. And that's it. You're off to the races at that point. You're, you're so going to, do, you, do you use like a box trap or what type of trap? So you don't harm it. Um, they would call it a BC. The, a BC is essentially it's, it's basically made of hardware cloth. It's like quarter inch hardware cloth. And it's a box, but it's got um, like nylon nooses on the top of it. And there's a gerbil that runs around on the inside that you put in there. And uh, the red tail comes down, tries to grab the gerbil. And when, in doing so, he's going to get his feet snared in those nooses. And uh, he can't fly away with that trap. The trap's got weights in it. And then you would jump out and grab him real quick and get the nooses off and put equipment on them and start your journey. Holy shit. <laughs> so is the is the hunting season like is is that the same like as it would be for shotgun for instance out in, out in Iowa it starts you know last weekend in October and goes through January 10th is that what your season would be is or different because you're using falconry. Uh so with fa- yeah no so each uh, once again each state's different so for but most states, um, they'll give you an extended falconry season. So it's usually, um, which only applies to non-migratory games. So um, duck hunting and stuff like that, you still have to follow the regular laws. But with like upland birds um, here, it's September 1st to March 1st. And the limits are different. Like you, um, for here, like the limits for quail is three a day instead of 15 with a gun. Um, I do believe Iowa probably has a extended fal- so it's probably September 1st till March 1st or October 1st till March 31st. It just, every state's different. Um, I'd have to look, um, but it's, I'm almost positive. They have a extended upland season just for falconry. So this is crazy. Like I I'm actually just, it's hard to even fathom how you how this works i mean it's obviously like you said it's been around forever you know but and a lot of people know how to do it but it's, can you go but if you remember can you go back to like your first hawk that you got and kind of give your experience of the difficulties that you ran into you know and like what you had to learn obviously to make it be successful yeah um i actually I struggled quite a bit when I first got started. I mean, I was around a lot of good falconers, but um, I wasn't as, so I, my first bird was a red tail and I mostly hunted squirrels. And uh, I had a new dog at the time that I'd, I'd never trained a squirrel dog in my life. So I had a new dog, a new bird, and I didn't even really know what the heck I was doing. Like I knew how to hunt squirrels, but I didn't know what good squirrel habitat looked like. Um, so and then I lived in St. Louis, so it's a very urban sprawl city. Um, that, that was probably the hardest part was um, learning not only how to find squirrels, but how to find squirrels that you could hunt. Like, yeah, you might see squirrels all over neighborhoods, but you're not going to go hunt squirrels in a neighborhood. You're going to, you need to go find them in the woods. And that's, that could be, that could be a, a deep learning curve for some people. Um, 
like I grew up hunting deer and turkeys, but you see squirrels, but there's a difference between seeing squirrels and then finding spots where you can see 20 squirrels an hour. And that's, that's so night and day. And that's, that's probably the hardest part about falconry. And that is why I, I really try to get gun hunters into falconry because they already know their quarries, you know, like you guys know how to find pheasant. So um, if you had a red tail, showing a red tail pheasant wouldn't be that big of a leap for you. You would just have to learn the bird side of it. So like someone like you guys would have a lot easier introduction to falconry than the average person, because the average person I see get into falconry, they weren't a hunter first. They use falconry as their gateway to hunting. And that's a steep learning curve. If you haven't been hunting your whole life. I mean, how does a bird not just <laughs> fly away? Like, so there's a there's steps in between like um like hash brown he's a goshawk that i raised from hand so every meal he's gotten in his life has come from me so okay that's different for him but with like a wild trapped red tail i mean they do take off and fly away but while you're training them the first step is to get them to step off a perch to your glove for a piece of meat and then so that's a battle of will for a couple days and then then it's they fly three feet from their perch to your glove for me and then it's 15 feet and then eventually they're coming then you're outside and they're flying 100 yards from their perch to you for food and then once they're flying that far and they're doing it every day pretty consistently you have a feel for what their weight needs to be to get a response out of them and then once you figure out that weight usually the weight they'll come to you at is a weight that they'll chase stuff at so you put them up in a tree and on the edge of a, a field and flush a pheasant or a rabbit or a squirrel, they're, they're generally going to chase it. Um, and they can't fly off with those things. So <laughs> you catch up to them once they're on their rabbit or their squirrel, and you would put down the lure that they've been eating off of in your care for three weeks now. And you, it, we do it, what we would call a trade off and they would step off their kill to cleaned meat on a leather lure. And then they would eat off that. And then you would take the, squirrel from them and you put in your bag and you give you them their their daily ration and then uh either go go home and do it again the next day or it just depends Dude, that is absolutely insane like it sounds it's, a ton of fun to it's so much fun man like don't get me wrong i love gun hunting and i love developing my dogs but doing a once i have a developed dog and putting a bird over him is it's just in its own realm. And for me, um, and then I, I have buddies that have dogs that I'll fly my birds over. If, if, if it's a buddy that's got a good enough handle on his dog and the dog's broke, I don't, I don't mind. Hey, that would be, do you hunt, do you hunt all over or you just stay? Um, I hunt all over like Mexico? this year, this year we hit Arizona, Montana, uh, Texas, Colorado, and Utah so I, I travel a good bit man if you ever come to iowa and want to do some like bob white quail you should let us know yeah. i love that because i yeah. wouldn't even take my dogs i'd just want to come out and see this thing work like dude this sounds you, awesome. the i guess the thing i've left out the most is you guys will be mystified to see the way quail and pheasant act when you have a hawk that's actively <laughs> chasing them it is oh. so different like, and then the way quail and all those birds respond to not only like my goshawk, it might be different if I had a Harris hawk. Like, it's crazy how much they know about the birds that are in the air, um, just through instinct. Um, I used to try to fly Oplomatos on quail and they, uh, which is a type of falcon and man, they do not want to fly when there's a falcon above them. They know what a falcon is and they know they don't want to get in the air with them. I guess that's um, why you have that shirt that says run faster die, die flying, flying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they run they they see the hawk and they don't want to fly they they want to run um that's why i taught my visa of verbal flushing because a lot of times my hawk will be hovering and the dog's running and the quail are running and scaly they're known for running but they run even more with a hawk and uh the dog wants to point the hawk's hovering and i'm trying to get him to flush because i can't get there i'm not as fast as a dog and at that point they're already 50 yards in front of me and uh, he'll get the quail going, but a lot of times only like 10 out of 30 will get up and fly. And you'll have quail running through your legs. They're so scared of the hawk, they'll run right through a human's legs. It's hilarious. 
Um, it's, it becomes Jeez. chaos really quick. It amazes me that they can even like that they can even see that hawk and some of the brush that they're in, right? Oh, well, they see the silhouette of their wings, and that's that's well, what it is. That they're like, nope, <laughs> I'm done. That shit's crazy. <laughs> so would you say would you say that a a pointing dog is is much better for doing this, or would you rather have like a flushing breed? Um, for what I'm doing, a pointing dog is very helpful, but for falconry as a whole, like probably most people's falconry, flushing dogs are way better. Um, Cause they run and whatnot. Well, they'll keep up with the hawk. They're going to flush. I mean, and any flushing dog is going to flush a rabbit as hard as it's going to flush a, a pheasant. So throughout what you're doing in falconry, a flushing dog can be used on anything you can use. I mean, you can get a lab going on squirrels if you really wanted to. Like my friend Hannah's up in North Dakota and she uh, she runs her Vizsla and her red tail on squirrels and the Vizsla has learned to be a squirrel dog. It's kind of it's kind of cool. But then she'll put the hawk up and she'll go out and gun hunt over that same dog and they learn the difference really fast. They know. So do you limit out like every time that you're out then, Tyler? No. Um man i i wish i wish there's there's days where the hawk's just not feeling it and we, we'll catch one and we're done and then there's days where he's johnny on the spot and we'll catch three in an hour and and catch a rabbit on the way to the truck so last year the quail limit was six so i've caught limits of six before and that's that's so hard that he has to be like so perfectly dialed in and the dog's got to be on it too Cause you only have like a two, three hour window to hunt, you know, like you're only going to get a response out of this bird for so long. Like the, you're not going to go out there for six hours and chase game. They're yeah, going to get bored. Yeah. Um, so um, I have one dog that she doesn't really care for the whole falconry thing. I mean, she'll participate, but what we would do is we'd be catching one quail and I'd be giving his, him his ration for catching that quail and she'd be 500 yards off on the next covey so i would walk from one quail catch to a fresh <laughs> covey and we would just leapfrog that way and that was the only way i was able to ever do six quail in under three hours that's just it took a very fine-tuned machine to get it to happen and it it didn't even end up happening till the end of the season last year my goodness that's just <laughs> absolutely insane we would have liked we went to montana last october and uh we were hunting huns and uh a pheasant got up and put in to a like a real thick i, I guess it would be a fence row it's just like a row of trees between two cut uh, crop fields and uh my hawk put a pheasant into that and we went in to go get that pheasant to fly again and uh i sent the dog into flush and pheasant came out of there like cockroaches but they would not fly it was like Looney Tunes, like 10, 15 pheasant just running every direction, but they would not fly. They were so scared of that hawk. They were like, no, nope, I'll run to safety. That is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, I just can't even imagine. You know? Oh, it was, it, it was new for me. Like, I had never seen anything like that because, I mean, I don't get to hunt pheasant much where I'm at. So, so when you. You're, you can, gun hunt do you i mean do you really enjoy it as much anymore i mean oh totally um i still enjoy it i mean i don't i'll gun hunt all like i'll gun hunt mornings and then my hawk he, he's kind of got a schedule he usually wants to fly in the evening so i'll gun hunt mornings and then eat lunch and then kind of put around and then get the hawk out in the evening so man that is so awesome where do you was your next trip to i don't have any plans for next season yet that's i haven't made anything yet i don't i don't know where where i'm gonna be at but i sh my dogs i should have a solid string of dogs for next year so i'm pretty excited i'm telling you if you make it to anywhere yeah, in iowa, iowa you definitely have to let us know we'll we'll because... meet you yeah I'd, I'd be down um We'd love to. i really want to get over to that part so i I've done this side of the country a whole bunch every year and I need to start going and doing different things. So is, would your, 
uh, would your bird now be able to handle pheasants if you came to Iowa or would you yeah, still carry caught, a gun? He's caught, I think he's caught about a dozen pheasant in two years. He's, he's caught a few. Um, we just don't have them here. So he doesn't get to see them consistently. And then is there a, obviously I, you know, pheasant, you can tell male, female very easily. Is there a law or a regulation? No, we're allowed to, yeah, we're allowed to catch hens. Oh, nice. I mean, obviously I don't want to, um, yeah. but we're allowed to. The other thing with falconry is um, I can let that hen go. She's not going to be, she'll be fine. As long as the dogs don't catch him and it's the hawk that catches him, I can get him off of anything he catches without him killing it. They're actually oh. pretty bad about killing stuff. They're uh, even quail. Like he, I generally am the one that jumps in there and kills it real quick. And then he'll <laughs> go back to plucking feathers. Cause um, so falcons will reach in and break necks. They've got that little notch on their beak to break, um, to sever vertebrae, but hawks don't have that. So he'll generally just eat something until it dies. Like it's, it's kind of gruesome, but that's just how they do it in the wild. They're, they, being humane doesn't cross their mind. So that's why we as falconers will, will move in and we'll, we'll kill the jackrabbit or kill the pheasant or quail or whatever it is for them. Just so it's, I mean, I, I don't watch falconry to watch him fight with a duck fighting for its life on the ground for 45 minutes. It's not really what I want to see. So I'll just reach in there and stretch its neck and then give him his, his food and be done with it. So if he catches like a hen pheasant, I can get him off of it. It's no big deal. That is awesome. Yeah. Jesus. Do you have like a recall form? Obviously you said you give him like a portion of food, but let's say. He'll come uh, to the lure. Like okay. if he goes and lands on a telephone pole or something, he'll come down. Yeah. Um, his recall isn't the best. Um, unfortunately, um, when you're trying to get them to do things like fly quail and fly upland birds, it takes a little bit more fitness than it would a rabbit. So in order to do that, their weights are a little bit higher. So their response to recall is a little bit slower, which is fine. Um, if we're putting up game, it's fine. Um, it's when he gets bored and he's at those high weights, it can be kind of a pain in the butt. <laughs> Yeah, that is so he like you said he literally just rides in on your hand while you're yep, out yep. there until a bird he'll, ride the glove or... for, he'll sit on the glove and look around for two three hours um how do you transport him like to the field yeah he he's got like a it's an upright box that's tall and skinny and it's got a perch inside it's dark in there and he's trained to generally like he's got a routine at home like he when he's not hunting, he, he's got a weathering yard where he's tethered to a perch. I'll go out there. I'll pick him up. I'll come inside. He'll fly to his scale. I'll check his weight and he'll go from his scale. He'll fly into his box and I'll close the door. He's, he's pretty pattern trained to do that on his own now, but he's done it 400 times, you know? He's, yeah. Yeah. How old is he? He's uh he'll be two in June, but this, this is the end of his second hunting season. So. So how many birds has he caught then roughly in those two years? He's caught over, he's caught over 400 quail in two years. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. He's, he's caught about three dozen ducks, like 400 quail and probably about 150 rabbits. Damn. He's, he's, he's pretty good at what he does. So what kind um, of ducks is he catching? He will not touch a mallard. He hates mallards. Mallards fight back, so he's not a fan. Um, he's caught wood ducks, um, some ringnecks, some gadwall, and uh, widgeon, and shovelers. He loves shovelers. He knows shovelers are slow, and he knows they flush last. So if we flush a group of ducks, he'll pick that shoveler out of there like nothing. <laughs> wow. And he just like just takes it right out of the air, just yeah, he'll like a linebacker coming in and just. Smoked. So with falconry, well, with a goshawk, ducks, generally we're flushing them off a ditch. So the whole group will get up and they'll start to go and he'll fly and he'll hit the deck real low. And then he'll come, he'll, he'll hit right underneath them and he'll go straight up and grab them from below. Um, this year he caught a widgeon about a hundred feet in the air and it was probably one of the coolest duck flights he's ever done. And 
man, he, he wanted a piece of that widget and he, uh, he plucked a male widget out of a group of like 30 or 40 and it was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> he just goes up i mean he might go right into the middle of this whole group and just grab yeah he'll go right he'll fly past 10 and grab he, he just picks one and he, that's the duck he's just gonna grab keeps just like a missile keeps locked on that one and just goes yeah for it. i don't know i don't know how his targeting system works but he when, when 